There has been a chant from the fossil fueled peanut gallery that EVs are getting heavier and heavier and that it is a huge problem. Initially, they tried to say that EVs were going to destroy the roads with their massive heft. We debunked that back in a FUD busting video a while back. Link is up here. But now we've seen plenty of headlines about how the weight of EVs is an issue for a multitude of other reasons. And that, yeah, well, that is true. So I suppose we should probably talk about that. Before we get into playing a long round of EVs suck because they're heavier, I think it's important to acknowledge something. Cars have generally been getting heavier for a long time. A typical family saloon has ballooned in weight for a variety of reasons. One of those is the increase in accessories and equipment. My Morris Minor, being the deluxe, has the full set of options ticked. It has the bumper overriders, a wing mirror, twin sun visors, and came with the heater as standard. Uh, driving the Morris Minor Deluxe is basically just bourgeois hedonism. Although, to be fair, even my four-door Deluxe only has a key on the right-hand front door, because only the driver should be able to unlock the car, and because we all know that the driver will be sitting on the right-hand side of the vehicle. Any vehicles with the steering wheel on the left, manufactured or converted like mine, require the driver to enter from the right-hand side and just slide across the seats and, well, suck it up. But modern vehicles often sport at least one full-on computer system just for entertainment, in addition to the many CAN bus-linked smaller systems scattered around the car. Electric windows, seats, mirrors, sunroofs, heated and cooled seats and literally miles of cable to connect the whole lot. Oh, and air conditioning, and many have multiple screens splashed throughout the vehicle. There are also structural and equipment requirements to meet modern safety standards. They couldn't even convince Isigonis to include door locks that won't pop open in an accident, but modern vehicles have multiple airbags, crumple zones, side impact protection beams, restraint systems that tighten seat belts, advanced driver assistance systems that apply the brakes for you and try to reduce frontal collisions, to name but a few. And as a society, we've groundhog dayed the discussion about how the average weight of vehicles is increasing and increasing, apart from occasional slight drops. The second oil crisis in the 1970s gave us lighter cars and the short-lived hope that we might transition to EVs then. I really try not to think too much about how much better the climate would be if that had happened. The start of European safety testing, the introduction of various fuel economy measures around the world, all of those have led to brief downward spikes in vehicle weights. but. Overall, weights have just trended upwards. This data from back in the mid-90s from the National Academy of Sciences shows the precipitous drop as a result of the oil crisis and the introduction of the CAFE standards in the US, and then a steady climb upwards. And this lovely graph from Robbie Andrew shows much the same in Norway. And this one from Hannah Ritchie covering 2011 to 2020 shows the massive shift that we've seen in just the last decade. And before Fred actually gets his keyboard warrior hat on, yes, some EVs are included in those graphs, but they make up such a small proportion of vehicle sales in most countries during the times that we're covering that really it doesn't matter. Oh, and those graphs also show what an outlier the US is. but. Maybe we'll put a pin in that because I expect it'll come up later. So, like I said back at the intro, there's a lot of disinformation out there right now saying that EVs will destroy road surfaces because apparently, yeah, not everyone spends their evenings reading Feynman's lectures on physics. But that just isn't the case. Heavier vehicles aren't great for road surface damage, for sure, but Honestly, the order of magnitude difference in the weight of trucks is really the road surface killer. I must not drive lorries. Lorries are the road surface killer. Lorries are the little death that brings total road surface obliteration. 
I must not drive lorries. Lorries are the roads. Shifting a big chunk of that freight onto rail would do so much more for the roads than persuading everyone not to buy an SUV. Attention, attention! You are in violation of questioning the doctrine of the mighty road. Please remain where you are and await the arrival of... The man? Who will ensure you are sent for reprogramming? All hail the V8. Yes. yes. All hail. All hail. But that doesn't mean that the rise in vehicle weights isn't a problem. A great example is the Chevrolet Sonic, which weighs about the same as a 1967 Chevrolet Chevelle. That Chevelle is about 20 to 40 inches, that's half a metre to a metre longer than its modern cousin, depending on whether you're comparing it to the Sonic hatchback or sedan. And yes, yes, this is still an ICE vehicle I'm talking about. I'm not even on to EVs yet. And that gradual ballooning of weight has brought with it several significant problems. Heavier vehicles have a significant impact on mortality in motor vehicle incidents. Research shows that in collisions, the baseline fatality probability, that is the probability that someone will die, increases nearly 50% for every extra thousand pounds of vehicle weight. Which would be bad by itself, but is made worse by the fact that baseline fatality probability also increases further if the striking vehicle is an SUV, a pickup, or a minivan. Two of those are the most popular types of vehicle on sale in the US right now. And that increase in mortality is because in smaller cars you're more likely to hit someone's legs, which... And I know, I know, I'm going to break out some high-level medical knowledge here, Legs have not got a lot of important organs in them, at least if you're a human. If you're a giant human-sized sea spider, well, all bets are off. But the legs take the brunt of the impact and then you're thrown onto the hood if you're hit by a small car. When you're hit by a high-riding truck, SUV, or God's have mercy, a lifted version of the same, you're hit in the torso or even the head. For most people, their head contains something quite important. <laughs> Although, reading the YouTube comment section, that's clearly not so much of a concern for some people. So yeah, let's be clear. Bigger, heavier cars carry an immediate risk to those around you, and that's true for EVs as well as fossil fueled vehicles. Something that the IIHS has commented on. Now, some of you are probably thinking about how bigger vehicles are safer for the occupants of said vehicle, which is Kinda true, although SUVs have a much higher rollover risk. The little sticker on the sun visor isn't just there for funsies. So it does depend on what you're doing in the vehicle, how much safer they are. But this is a race with no winners, because we can't just keep increasing the size of cars every year to infinity. So if you've got the biggest car this year, that doesn't stop your neighbours going out and buying a bigger one next year and so on and so on. Eventually we're going to have to put a stop to this, and ideally we should do that before we're all just driving our houses around. And as we release this video, Tesla has just had the seminal unveiling of its, frankly dystopian future inspired, Cybertruck. A vehicle intended by its progenitor to destroy any car or indeed pedestrian that it hits in an onanistic demonstration of its strength and power. As Musk himself said, well, let's just hand over to Musk. And if you're ever in an argument with another car, you will win. Well, I hate to break it to you, sweetie, but my friend Lauren owns a tank. And if your Cybertruck is in a collision with her choice of vehicle, she's just gonna roll right over it. And to be fair, if someone with a bigger tank turns up, they'll just roll right over hers. This is a ridiculous game and one we need to stop automakers from playing. And since I'm up on my hobby horse, I might as well finish off my little rant with a little infrastructure comment. We already have a situation in North America where the amount of land subsidised for cars is vast. Parking lots and street parking, the size and quantity of which is basically determined by a process as scientific as pulling figures out from a bingo tumbler, and the massively resource wasteful roads that occupy vast swathes of North American cities, they're going to have to get bigger if we keep buying bigger cars. 
tour many parking lots and you'll find that the spaces often struggle to accommodate the vast girth of the modern SUV or pickup. Which allows me to hop off my hobby horse and onto that of mainstream media's rampage about EVs. Some of you may remember that earlier this year a parking garage in New York collapsed, injuring five people and killing one. At the time there was an immediate outcry that EVs were at fault because of their weight, which it turned out unsurprisingly wasn't the problem when the investigation concluded. The 64 building code violations over many years, including defective and cracked concrete, was probably more at fault. But as the Institution of Structural Engineers stated in their updated design guidance for parking garages, which was published earlier this year and says, there are important safety and economic implications of the increased size and weight of the quote average vehicle, up from 1.5 metric tons in 1974 to almost two tons today. These increased loadings are considerations not just for new car parks, but in the thousands which already exist today. So that vehicles have a weight problem is basically a given, and that the problem just keeps getting worse is also the status quo just being the status quo. It's getting worse now more quickly because SUVs are getting more popular and they're bigger still. And for us in North America, we're starting from a point that's worse off in terms of vehicle weight for safety, for parking structures, for infrastructure in general, and for people because we're starting from a history of driving bigger vehicles anyway. But why specifically is this an extra problem for EVs? Well, it comes down to one significant thing. Efficiency. Heavier cars are less efficient. Back in 2012, Rhett Allen from Wired produced this pretty little graph showing the impact of vehicle weight on vehicle efficiency. It's not from a super scientific study, but it's a cute little graph and it actually mirrors research on the same topic. EVs carry massively less energy in them than fossil fuel vehicles. The reason that they're useful is because electric vehicles are simply massively more efficient than fossil fuel vehicles. An industry guideline is that a 10% reduction in weight produces a roughly 6% improvement in efficiency, which results in a roughly 14% increase in driving range. Which is why we've seen in particular some legacy automakers resorting to larger and larger batteries to try and meet the demand that they've encouraged for both bigger and bigger vehicles and at the same time the notion that they've also pushed that everyone needs 300 plus miles of range. Scoring high on both those metrics requires a very large battery pack, plus the ability to at least be moderately efficient which is part of why we laid into the Hummer EV so heavily when we reviewed it, because honestly, it sucked. And those big battery packs are heavy, which means that in addition to all those problems of heavier gasoline vehicles that we discussed, it also becomes markedly less efficient. And you end up in this dispiriting loop of disappointment where the pack is heavier, so it's less efficient. So it doesn't go as much further as the manufacturer might like. And so they put in a bigger pack which is heavier, and so it's less efficient, and so it doesn't go as much further as they'd like. And so you put in a bigger- Oh, oh crap. Um, hey, um. Yeah, coming, coming. Kate Scott stuck in a recursive loop, and I, I, I don't see anything in the manual. Have you tried unplugging her and plugging her back in? No, and I don't know where the power cable or the switch are. Uh, I've heard there's been some modifications that might be a question for her doctor. Sorry, I got stuck in a loop there. The question is, how do we break that loop? First up, we've seen a massive growth in the network of e charging infrastructure, not just in North America and Europe, but around the world. That helps with combating people's desire to own a vehicle that goes eight times further than their average daily mileage. Hopefully the increasing pressure both legally and from customers to improve the reliability of those networks and in North America the fact that other networks will now be competing against the supercharger network's enviable uptime will help improve the reputation of rapid charging. In Europe, incidentally, that's been the situation for a while with the supercharger network gradually opening over the past few years to service any brand. 
Then there's the fact that battery energy density is increasing, which will eventually mean that smaller lighter battery packs will be required to meet people's range desires. Energy density has been on a pretty rapid upward path for a while, and we've heard a lot of big announcements over the past few years, but it takes a while for those to make it into cars. And then, obviously, some automakers are addressing this challenge by using multiple materials rather than just steel. Aficionados of the BMW i3 saw this with carbon fibre bodies and a selection of interesting plastics and recycled materials throughout. That's something we've also seen from other automakers with aluminium, carbon fibre and lightweight plastics continuing to make up more and more significant proportions of the vehicles, with both sheet metal and cast and extruded components being replaced by these lighter materials. The problem with that, particularly when it comes to aluminium, is that the energy used to make a metric ton of aluminium is about 10 times the amount required to make a metric ton of steel. And yes, you need less, but really it doesn't quite work out as well as you might like. So yes, sure, making the mahusive vehicle lighter with aluminium does help at the efficiency end of the equation, but it doesn't really help at the manufacturing end or at the point of contact end in an accident. Some automakers are addressing the problem through really astonishing improvements in efficiency. Lucid and the no longer making cars Lightyear have both produced vehicles with phenomenal levels of efficiency, but in both cases these came with substantial research and development costs that lead to vehicles that are, shall we say, not cheap? That are not the sort of thing that you're going to see a ton of parked outside Target? So that still leaves open the question of what you can do, because the majority of our viewership are definitely not in the two Lucids and a Porsche Taycan for the weekend set. And there's a few things you can do. Remind automakers that smaller cars are still something people want. Email them, call their comment lines, whine at their dealer staff nicely. We see the pent-up demand from folks in our Discord, we see it from the folks on Mastodon, we see it from our Patreons, we see it in the YouTube comments section. Tell them that those are the vehicles you want. Telling us is nice, but we can't do anything about it. Tell your Congress critters at the state and federal level that legislation that encourages smaller vehicles, or at least removing legislation that currently encourages and protects production of larger vehicles, is something you also want to see. And I guess finally, as we've talked about before, you all can remind them with your wallets. Get the smallest vehicle that works for you, whether that's an EV, an e-bike, an e-scooter, or just a plain old ticket for the e-bus. Thanks for joining me today, and if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now, they are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure we can be 100% independent. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Patreon user 1124, Gordon Smith, Alan Williams, Tim Nicholas, Jalia Hallett, and Nathan Plowman. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up to for as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box that you can reach us at. Address is down below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store also in the down below. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!